Welcome to video two for week five for Math 300. In the previous video, we introduced polar coordinates, where, which were a type of nonlinear coordinate in R2. Here we want to introduce two types of nonlinear coordinates in three dimensions. These are going to be spherical and cylindrical coordinates. And they follow the same pattern as polar coordinates in R2 of using angles and radii to try and describe what's going on instead of the conventional axes of Cartesian coordinates. So let me start with cylindrical coordinates. So the idea here that cylindrical coordinates have polar coordinates in the xy plane. So this looks exactly like it did before for polar coordinates in the xy plane. We have some radius, which is the distance out from the z-axis. Um, and then we have some angle theta starting counterclockwise from the x-axis. And that tells us the position of a point in the xy plane. And the z-coordinate here is the same as the Cartesian z-coordinate. So if I have a point up here, then I sort of look where it came from in the xy plane. So it has some radius, some angle, and then it has some height z above that point. And you can perhaps sort of see the cylindrical construction that we get here because we get concentric circles all the way up at different heights. And if you put all these concentric circles together, you get a kind of cylindrical shape to this coordinate system. So the z coordinate is the same either way as in cylindrical coordinates. Z is the same as Cartesian Z, and the X and Y transformations are the same as they were for polar coordinates in R2. To go from polar coordinates to Cartesian coordinates, X was R cos theta, Y was R sine theta, and vice versa. These were the two identities we derived in the previous video. The radius is the square root of X squared plus Y squared, and the angle is the arctangent of Y over X. The thing to remember about this radius is it's the distance out from the z-axis. So if I have a point down here, the radius is the distance from the closest point on the z-axis. Because we're just sort of having this movement of these polar coordinates up and down with the z-coordinate as much as we wish. And let me talk briefly about the kind of loci that that, give us. that gives us. r equals a constant. So if the radius is a constant, that's all points that have a fixed distance to the z-axis. So that's going to give us precisely this infinitely tall cylinder, because these are all the points where the distance out from the z-axis is the same. Theta be, being equal to constant, so theta is the angle from the axis here. So if I have a fixed theta, I'm going to get all the points of any height that point out from the origin, from the z-axis, at that angle. So I'm going to get not a whole plane, but a half plane that stops the z-axis. So all sort of the things, if I think about it, sort of a plane like this that has that angle sticking out from the z-axis and then extending all the way out to infinity, this half plane is described by theta equals a constant. And then z equals a constant is just a horizontal plane at a fixed height, like it would be in Cartesian coordinates. So you have these horizontal planes. Those are the loci you get by setting each of the coordinates equal to zero. And those are nice ones to think about because that gives you a sense of what this coordinate system is good for. It's very good at describing cylinders. It does a good job at vertical half planes. It does a good job at horizontal planes. Uh, there are also other things we can do. So let me give you one more example here. r equals absolute value of z. So that tells us that radius and the height are the same. Well, that means that as we go up or down from the origin, the radius is going to increase. What that's going to give us, since the angle can be anything, is that's going to give us a double cone. Double meaning that the cone extends in both the positive and negative directions. Uh, absolute value of z, so we can actually get positive radii. We want the radius to be positive. So each of these points, so say we have here z equals negative 2. So that at this point where I have the radius equal to 2, down here at z equals negative 4, the radius is going to be 4. Down here at z equals negative 6, the radius is going to be 6. That's why we get the flare of this cone, because the further up or down we go in height, the larger the radius we get. So cylindrical coordinates are also nice for describing conical shapes. 
The second thing I want to introduce here are spherical coordinates, and unsurprisingly, these are based on the sphere. And to understand these, I want you to think of the globe, because the globe is uh, one of the clearest examples of the sphere. And we use some similar uh, terminology to the globe here. So if I have a globe, I have a radius, which is the distance out from the origin. So unlike in cylindrical coordinates, this radius is the distance from any point to the origin, not to the z-axis. So if I have some point uh, somewhere out, I'm going to draw the line from that point to the origin, look at the length of that line. That gives me the radius of the sphere that I'm on. So once I'm on a particular sphere, the other two things are going to be angles, and these are essentially like latitude and longitude on a globe. They're set up slightly different. So let me, let me be very clear. The first angle, phi, is going to be called colatitude, and it's called colatitude because it counts for a different spot. We're going to have phi equals zero at the top of the sphere. And then phi is going to be the angle as we go down, so that phi is going to be pi radians at the bottom. So latitude, we think from 90 to negative 90, if you think about north and south being positive and negative. So instead of, so in, in latitude, we have zero at the equator. So this co-latitude is exactly the same kind of thing, but we have zero at what would be the north pole instead of zero at the equator. And we count down a positive angle as we shift down. So that each point is given by small angles here, angles getting larger, angle is pi over two at the equator, and the angle getting larger, and angle getting larger, angle at pi at the south pole. So that gives us a height-like function using a thing like latitude. And then we have longitude, which is the same thing as it is in ordinary uh, use of the globe. The only difference here, again, the range, instead of going from negative 180 to positive 180, we think of east and west as negative. We go from zero to two pi, and we think about the zero longitude as being on the x-axis, and we go counterclockwise to go all the way to two pi. So we get an angle going around uh, at a particular fixed latitude, that longitude angle. And with latitude and longitude, or co-latitude and longitude, we can describe any point on the sphere. And with radius, we can describe any sphere. And between those three things, we can describe any point in three-dimensional space. Any point in three-dimensional space exists on some sphere, whatever the distance out is. So if I have a point that's seven units out, it's on a sphere of radius seven. If it's 100 units out, it's on a sphere of radius 100. And then its point on that sphere is given by its latitude and its longitude. Unsurprisingly, spherical point coordinates are very good for describing things that have spherical types of setup and symmetry. Let me talk about the transformations. I'm not going to drive these all. Uh, you'd have to do a bunch of trigonometry based on those two angles, but let me give you what they are. To go from spherical back to Cartesian, uh, the x, y, and z coordinates are given by the radius, and then some trigonometry based on those two angles, phi being the co-latitude and theta being the longitude. And then to go backwards, the distance is just Pythagoras square root of the components of the vector. Um, theta is like the angle in polar coordinates. Um, longitude is sort of in the xy plane. Longitude is sort of going around circles in the, in, in the xy plane or parallel to the xy plane. So we have the arctangent y over x again. And calculating the angle phi, this angle down from the vertical from the north pole in terms of the Cartesian coordinates turns out to be the arctan of squared x squared plus y squared divided by z. And again, I'm not going to do the full derivations of those in this video. Uh, feel free to try and do the trigonometry on yourself if you are so inclined. It's sort of interesting to work it out. Uh, but these are the transformations. So this is going one direction, and this is going the other direction. And now if we want to change from Cartesian to spherical, or spherical to Cartesian coordinates, we know how to do so. And lastly, the conventional loci and spherical coordinates. R equals a constant. That's all points that have a fixed radius. Well, that gives us just a sphere, because everything going out here is a fixed distance away from the origin. Uh, theta equals c is a half plane, exactly like it was for polar coordinates. So this is setting a fixed angle out. And so I would get all things in some kind of half plane, vertical half plane, sticking out from the z-axis in a certain direction. 
and phi equals c, so a latitude being fixed. That latitude is the angle down from the z-axis. So that's fixed. I can spin it around however I want, and that gives me a single cone, unlike the double cone of cylindrical coordinates. So phi equals c. These are all points that have the same angle out from the z-axis, the same latitude. They're on different spheres. They have different um, radius, radii, and they are different longitudes as we sort of spin around, but they're all on whatever sphere they're on, they're all exactly the same latitude. And if the latitude is small, I get here. If the latitude is larger, the angle is sort of down here, then I would get a cone. All of these would be at some larger phi, but I only get one half of this cone for each value of the angle phi.